So with the Masoretic text, the earliest we can go back to, why? Because the, they copied on parchment, they copied on, on even paper, but all of it decays, wears out, and so on. And so the earliest copy we had prior to the scrolls was the Leningrad text, which now is in the St. Petersburg Museum in Russia, is the earliest text. Now there's an Aleppo text in Israel that goes back to the 9th century AD, but it is partially burnt. It is not complete. And so along come the Dead Sea Scrolls and a complete scroll like the great Isaiah scroll. And suddenly we can push that historical knowledge of the text back another thousand to eleven hundred years. About second to first century. Uh, They may have been copied in the second century BC. Now this is very, very important. Why? Because and you can talk to your professors as well, Uh, the Septuagint Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament goes back to the 3rd and 2nd centuries B.C. And it's interesting because uh, uh, for a time, all scholars could check on would be the Masoretic texts from the 10th century and compare it to the Septuagint text that was done in the third, second century, but there's one problem. The earliest Septuag- complete Septuagint manuscript only went back to about the fifth century AD. They wear out. Now, and by the, the way, so they weren't always quite sure how accurate is the Greek translation of the Hebrew that went back that early, but it's about the same time as the scrolls. And what we're finding out is that a number of the Septuagint readings, which were a little different from the Masoretic text, were what we also find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That affects Bible translation. I'd like to give you one example just one example of this, and uh, it happens to be Psalm 145. Psalm 100, I hope I have that correct, yes, Psalm 145 is an acrostic psalm. What that means, that's a technical term, meaning the psalmist, when they wrote the psalm, they put it in a poetic form where the first letter of each verse is a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So that the first letter of the verse one would be Aleph, and then the word, and then a bait word, and a gamma word, or putting it in English, an A word, a B word, a C word, a D word, and 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So there should be 22 verses, but there aren't. Why? Because the N verse, you know, M, N, the N verse had dropped out. And in the copying process had dropped out. Now you can't tell when you translate it into English. Why? Because translators can't translate acrostically. They can't, quote, select a word that starts with A and B and so on and so forth. So the non-Hebrew reader would never know it. But anyone that knows the Hebrew text, the Nun was missing from the Masoretic text. And interestingly enough, doesn't seem, no, it is in the Septuagint text. Well, here it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, now I mention this because a number of Bible translations, including the one that uh, we have here, uh, the book of Isaiah, the International Standard Version, which will be, come out next year, are using the Dead Sea Scrolls heavily in terms of translation. 
So why the worldwide interest in the Dead Sea Scrolls? It has to do with the Bible and the interest in the Bible and the translation of the Bible and the publishing of the Bible, which uh, continues to go on as such. Now, a few other comments that I also, by the way, another example I can give you comes from 1 Samuel, the end of chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 11. By the way, there is a problem. And the problem translators face. Why? You can't suddenly add a verse number. That'll throw all the other verses off. And what does that do to the commentaries? What does that do to the references? What does that, that mess? Why? Because the verse numbers come out of the Middle Ages. So you have to get kind of creative. And for Psalm 145, it happens to be verse 13. So what they did was 13a and 13b. Okay, that kind of solved that problem and not mess up the numbering of the rest of the verses that go back to the Middle Ages. In 1 Samuel, at the uh, end of 1 Samuel, uh, it kind of is talking about Samuel explained to the people the regulations concerning kingship. He wrote them in a scroll and placed them before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all people to their own houses. Saul also went to his house in Gibeah, and the soldiers whose hearts had touched went with him. But some troublemakers said, how can this man deliver us? They despised him and did not bring a gift. But Saul remained silent. Now, there is a verse that comes in the Dead Sea Scrolls here, and it's this. Meanwhile, Nahash... N-A-H-A-S-H, king of the Ammonites, had been severely oppressing the Gadites and the Reubenites, gouging out their right eyes, not very nice guys, and not allowing Israel to have a deliverer. No one was left among the Israelites across the Jordan whose right eye, Nahash, king of the Ammonites, had not gouged out. However, 7,000 men had escaped from the Ammonites and entered Jabesh Gilead. That whole verse was not in the Masoretic text. Now, what was chapter 11, verse 1, started out, So after a month, Nahash the Ammonite came up and laid siege to Jabesh Gilead. All the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve you, and it goes on. So the translators decided, okay, we'll number this added verse 1028, not to mess up the numbering of the chapter before, because it's the last verse, and not to mess up the numbering in the chapter ahead. And so what they did, if you look at the paragraph, it begins with 1028, and then ends with 11.1. And that's the way they kind of did it. And I mention that because that's the effect that you begin to see in terms of making sure that the Bible is as accurate as possible because it is published in so many languages of the world. I think I'm going to stop here now and open it up if there are any questions Uh, I'm allowed to be up here a certain time, and when my time is up, uh, a big hole in the floor opens up here, so I've got to be done. But uh, any questions you might have or reactions, and uh, uh, with all these bright lights, you may have to yell out because I may not be able to see you. Yes, please stand. Okay, the question was, are there any variances in the text that have theological equivalents? As far as I can see, no. However, there are some passages in Isaiah that the Dead Sea Scrolls 
depending how you interpret them, are more messianic than even that that was copied and copied and copied and copied down through the centuries up to the 10th century. And you can understand that. Uh, because there was this kind of tug of war between the Christian copyists and the Jewish copyists and so on and so forth. So uh, that could have, I won't call it deep theological differences, but added aspects in terms of the messianic theme. Good question. 